you know, there are lots of different roots for plants. Lots of different kinds of roots. Matter of fact, I find it humorous whenever I go to some kind of pastor's conference and some preacher gets up and begins to wax eloquent about, you know, in the desert, the roots have to go deep. And sometimes God puts us in the desert to deepen our roots. And I'm sitting there thinking, desert plants don't have deep roots. Uh, the water doesn't go down deep. The water kind of sits along the surface. So they have broad, shallow roots to get at the most, but I don't ever stand up and correct them. I'm just like, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but, but lots of different kinds. We got picturing, see different kinds of, of, my favorite are like the redwoods because their roots all intertwine with one another so they can help to support one another. Really good sermon illustration there too. So this morning I want to talk, especially to dads, but to all of us about planting some right roots. And so if we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to look at the first 10 verses. First Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. <clears throat> Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspensions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. That if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. <clears throat> now he starts off <clears throat> by saying the first right root that we want to have is respect. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants. Now, I use the English Standard Version. It translates it bond servant. Some translations translate as slave or servant or something like that. So let's, let's just see if we can understand because it, it's really a, a challenge here. Words do not mean anything. Words do not have meaning. Words have usage. For example, what does the word I mean? Well, it could be the thing in your head. It could be the middle of a hurricane. It could be on a needle. So how do we know which one it is? By the way, it's used in a sentence. Okay, if you can't understand that sentence, I can't help you at all. Like that's the way, so, it, so words have usage. And sometimes a word can, add, can mean several different things. And this is certainly true when we come to the Bible and words for servant and slave. When we hear the word slave and master, our minds immediately go to the way slavery was practiced in the Western world for centuries, where people took a boat, over to Africa, either captured or bought people, put them on the boat and brought them back and sold them as property, where they were then worked like cattle or whatever. The Bible never, ever approves of that. Yeah, don't make me come down to amen myself. The Bible never approves of that. Remember, when the Bible talks about slavery as owning someone else, almost always it was someone that was captured in battle. So one of the dangers of losing in battle is that you could be dead. That's not good. What's your goal? Man, have my head cut off by a sword. No, it's like it's not good. Or if you lost, you could be captured and taken and treated as a slave. <clears throat> That's the closest the Bible gets to what we think of slavery. But the word slave and master could also be used of someone that's made a commitment to someone else. So actually the word bond servant is one of those. So what would happen is, let's say that you owe me some money and you can't pay it back. So what you could do in Bible times is you could come and work for me. You could work off your debt. And if at the end of that time you've worked off your debt, you think, you know what, Paul Smith's a pretty good guy. I kind of like working for him. I like the, the arrangements. All that. I'd like to continue to work for him. You could go and take an awl or a nail and drive it through your ear 
into a door. Then slam the door and it would rip your earlobe and that would leave a scar called a stigma, which is where we get the word stigma. And so you were saying, I've committed myself to you because I like this work environment. I, most of them were farmers, so I like working on this farm with you. And so I would like to stay. Another way that the word servant and master is used, what we think of as employer and employee. So, okay, which one is it here? I don't know. It probably has a little reference to all three of them. But in the context of this one, probably number two or number three, where you're working for someone. And so when you read master and slave in the Bible, understand it can be one of several possibilities. Uh, and so this situation is now going to create some issues. So that all those who are under a yoke as a bondservant regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. So the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. In other words, it says you need to respect the people that are in authority over you. In our culture, that would not just be employers, be school teachers and police officers and things like that. So, so we respect um, for other people. And so <clears throat> that's all fine and good, all right? So if I'm gonna be working for somebody, then I need to do it to the best of my ability. However, there's another problem that arises. So here we have a master and a slave, regardless what, which one of those situations it was, and they both become believers in Jesus. And they show up at church together. And Timothy, who's pastor of the church at Ephesus, the person to whom Paul's writing this letter, Timothy gets up and says, you know what? In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, bond or free. Well, if you're a slave, that sounds pretty good. Everybody's equal before Jesus. And we agree with that. So everybody's equal. So that all sounds really good and fine. But since we're equal with Jesus, now when I go to work, if my boss, or in this case they use the word master, is also a believer, I tell him, hey, boy, boy, you can't tell me what to do. We're equal in Jesus. Didn't you listen to the sermon Sunday? If not, I'll send you the link. <laughs> like <he's>, so <clears throat> notice what he says then in verse 2. Those who are believing masters must not be disrespectful. Or those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. So you can't say, well, you're a believer and I'm a believer. So you know what? Uh, I'm not going to work today since we're equal. I'm just not feeling it. It's not like that. As a matter of fact, you should still be faithful, maybe even more faithful. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So here's the deal. Whether you're in a situation you like or one you do not like, as Christians, we are still to show respect to other people. If you've got a horrible job with a horrible boss, you should still do your best for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ and send out resumes. So he says, and so we want to give respect and show respect and we want to teach our children to be respectful. I found an article on Twitter recently that was fascinating. I thought that'd probably be sermon illustration material and voila, here it is. The title is No Wedding Ring Travel. It was written by a lady that went on vacation with a friend of hers. She decided to leave her wedding ring at home. Her friend was single. And so I'm not gonna read the whole three pages. I'm sure you're thankful for that. But the gist of it was, man, we went out, we would go dancing, and all these men would ask me to dance with them. We had a great time. Men always, you know, if I'd been wearing my wedding band, it wouldn't have happened. Now, I wonder what's it like when she wrote this article and she handed it to her husband and said, hey, look what I wrote. What do you think? I wonder what he thought. But the reality is, I usually just skim through articles because I'm not that interested in what the people write an article have to say. I like to see the comments that people post. Because when you put a comment, you can do it anonymously. People can say what they really think without fear of any kind of repercussions. Like, then now, to some extent, I guess you kind of, I mean, one of the screen names I use is Baptist Preacher. So I kind of can, I think they probably figure out at least what I do for a living. Um, and so, but people can, so I, I thought, man, that it'd be interesting to see what the responses are to this article. Almost all of them were roughly the same. I cannot believe that you would disrespect your husband and your marriage vows like that. Like most of the responses were, how could you be that disrespectful to your husband? 
Um, and I thought, you know, they're right. And what the Bible's saying here is that you and I need to plant the roots of respect for one another. And respect for relationships that we have with one another, whether it's a marriage or work or family or whatever it may be. And so that's the first root that we want to plant. The second root is teaching. In verse 2, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine. Now the idea of different is only somewhat different. Because the reality of something is way out there, like loco crazy, you go, that's just way out there loco crazy. Like it's not, but, but so it, there's always seems to be some kind of ring of truth to it. So that's the idea different. But what is doctrine? Doctrine just means teaching. One of these days I'm going to do the Paul Smith, everybody can understand it Bible. And I'll translate it with all normal words. I don't use doctrine anywhere in my life outside of church stuff. How many use the word, word doctrine this week not related to anything in church? Maybe from the military. There's a military doctrine, and I understand that. And I watched some of that tank doctrine. It's really fascinating historically, but that's another, that's not even a sermon. It's a history lesson. So it, it's a, it means teaching. So if anyone teaches a different teaching and does not agree with the sound words, the word sound means healthy, not agree with the healthy words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, what kind of person is that? Puffed up with conceit. Now, conceit's when you think you know more than everybody else, you're better than everybody else, and you let everybody else know it. That's conceit. But they understand nothing. Now, watch how the words are used. So, verse 3 says sound words, healthy words. And then verse 4 says this is an unhealthy. An unhealthy craving for what? For controversy, for quarrels about words. In other words, here's what he's saying. There are some people... They're false teachers, they, they, they teach a different doctrine, but man, they just love to argue. They love to argue about everything. And, and, they, they, and, and y'all know that an argument requires a winner and a loser. A discussion, you can both walk away winners, even if you disagree, but an argument requires a winner and a loser. And so the men, they just look, they want to argue and, and quarrel and fuss and fume and fight about all this kind of, and all these kind of little details. That's what they're doing because they're puffed up and conceited and think they know everything about everything. And so then they let everybody know everything that they know. So what does this produce? Envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagine that godliness is a means of gain. That, the idea is that they, they're doing it for their own gain, whether it's monetary gain, which is probably the idea here, or their own gain of popularity or, or uh, kind of the, you know, their ego stroke, that sort of thing. But I want you to notice what exactly he says here and what exactly he does not say here. He does not say avoid these people. He doesn't say to correct these people. He doesn't even say to respond to these people. He just says... They're out there. You and I need to root right teaching, not be always looking for what's wrong everywhere else. See, there are people who are right, but they're still wrong. I know, they're on YouTube. YouTube is full of people who are called discernment blockers. Now, what is a discernment blogger? A discernment blogger is someone that every few days or once a week or however they do it, puts out a video blog where they point out what's wrong with some preacher down the road. They show a clip from a sermon, a clip from a service, and one guy even starts all of his blogs this way. Now, this is not sinful attack. This is biblical critique. And then he proceeds just to rip someone. And every single blog is like that. Listen, you can be right and still not righteous. And so the Apostle Paul, what he's saying is you and I aren't to spend all of our time to figure out what's wrong with someone else. We need to spend our time teaching what is right. In fact, some of the best advice I was given when I was first a pastor was by an older pastor. And he said, look, God has called you to be a shepherd. And as a shepherd, you're going to feed the sheep and chase away the wolves. But if you spend all your time chasing wolves, the sheep will starve to death. I thought that was pretty good. And what the Apostle Paul is saying here is there are wolves that are out there. But as a parent, you don't want to spend all your time teaching your children everything that's wrong. Spend the bulk of your time teaching them what the Bible says so that they will believe it and live it. As a matter of fact, I, every, some of y'all watch them. Every Thursday I do a, I do a blog 
Theology Thursday. It's on our Facebook page and YouTube. <clears throat> I don't spend every Thursday telling you what's wrong with every other pastor or what's wrong with what someone's preaching. I would rather just teach, this is what's in the Bible. This is what the Bible says. We need to believe it and live it. I think that's far more productive than spending all of our time chasing every wolf that's out there. Because I know there are plenty of wrong teachers out there. YouTube is full of them as well. <laughs> and so the, the, the focus here and, and, the, and the focus, I think, as is, is dads is we want to instill in our children. We want to instill in them this is the truth. And if they know the truth, they'll spot it when it's not. We don't have to spend all of our time being discernment bloggers. Instead, he said, man, you do what is healthy and right. And then there's a third route we want to lay down, and that's a right perspective. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, what in the world is godliness? Y'all know what godliness is. It's when you put on your church whisper. Because godly people don't talk loud. And they're very humble. The Lord is speaking to me. God's really dealing with me about this. And, 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 and they, they, it's, I'm telling you, I can only take so much of that, man. I, I just like, I can't, I can't take it. Like, it just irritates me to no end. Um, I, you're not holy because you use a church voice. And you're always... Mm, like that. So what is godliness? Godliness means to be set apart. And the Bible makes it really clear and really simple. There are two circles. There's a world circle and there's a God circle. And so if you're in the world's circle, you're set apart to the world and you're set apart from God. If you are godly, you are in the God circle, which makes you set apart to Him and set apart from the world. That's it. Doesn't that sound so simple? Have y'all found that easy to live? <laughs> Well, it's simple to say, but he says, look, if you're going to live, so when he says that godliness with contentment is great gain, the idea is if we're going to be set apart to God and set apart from the world, then we realize that that is going to make us content because you brought nothing into the world and you cannot take anything out of the world. You can't. You, you know, matter of fact, Denzel Washington put it this way. He said, you'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. Now, I've been blessed to make hundreds of millions of dollars in my life. I can't take it with me, and neither can you. And that's what the Bible is saying here. You cannot take it with you. <clears throat> but if we have food and clothing, with these, we will be content. We'll have the necessities of life. Now, how many of you, when you hear, read something in the Bible, or you hear it said, it, it connects in your brain with something else? Oh, that was my grandmother's favorite verse. Or there's some song, and you read verse, like every time I read in Genesis about Esau and Jacob, and Esau is a hunter and he's hairy, I just can't help but hear Gaston singing in Beauty and the Beast. Every last tent of me is covered with hair. I mean, how could you not? Like, this is where I did, it kind of ruined it for me every time I read it. I just always hear that song. As a matter of fact, I can say three words that will immediately bring a song to the brain of every parent in here. Let it go. Some of you are like, really? Now we're going to have to go home and watch that thing. My daughter, I thought, had a brilliant solution. They do not own Frozen. That's the movie they watch at Opa and Granny's house. So I've seen it more times than I can imagine. Some of you are going to hear any of the rest of the sermon. All you're going to hear is just... Let it go, let it go. You hear that song in your brain. Now, when I read this verse, there's a song that comes to mind. We wanted lots of children because of some difficulties. We end up only having four. But we have kids. You watch a lot of cartoons and you learn them. I mean, you can sing the songs, you know the storyline. You just, you know, oh, don't start that again. From that movie, The Jungle Book, we run into a character named Baloo the Bear. Baloo sings a song to the little Mowgli. And the song is Bear Necessities. All you need are the bare necessities of life. You can pick a pawpaw. Come on, some of you are like, that's all you can hear now. Oh, the 
bare necessities. Like that's in your brain now. So every time I read this verse, and now probably every time you ever read this verse, you're going to think the preacher has ruined me. I can't even read the verse without hearing Balu the bear singing in my head. But the theology that Balu the bear sings is right. That's what he says, <clears throat> that we should be content with what we have. Because here's the reality. You can be content outside of God, but that contentment only lasts for a while and you have to get the next experience. And that contentment only lasts for a while. It's never lasting, it's never permanent, it's never deep, it's never real. But with God, the contentment is permanent, lasting, and real. And so he says that's the perspective. But verse nine gives the wrong perspective. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Now what you notice, it says desire to be rich. Nowhere does the Bible ever condemn being wealthy, ever. As a matter of fact, some people just have a way of making money. They just do. They do they're just, God's just designed them that way. That's the way their brain works. Now, my best friend from high school, he just makes money. He just makes money. Um, he just has a mind for business. I have a family member that started raising bees he said, you know, Paul, this is the first thing I've ever done where I don't think I'm going to make money. He just, that's just, he's just a businessman. That, that's who he is. And so there's nothing wrong with being rich. I thought somebody would say amen because you want to be one of them. Amen. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. So he says that, that, that but it's the desire, the thinking that being wealthy will solve everything. They fall into temptation, a snare, and many senseless and harmless, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Money doesn't ruin people, but the love of money does. And that's what he says in verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Not money itself, but the love of money. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. We need to teach our children to be rooted with a right perspective about possessions. About a, that, that, that we are content with God. That we don't have to chase more in order to be satisfied. And this is where I think we really see this. In the United States, approximately 23% of married couples will get divorced. About 20% of males, about 23% of females. But among celebrities, the divorce rate climbs to 52%. About 50% for male and 62% for female. So I've asked myself many times, why is this? And I've read, you know, well, it's hard to live in the limelight, blah, 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 blah. But here's kind of what I've come to the conclusion. Once you have reached fame and become very wealthy, you discover they don't satisfy. So now you think, well, maybe a different spouse would satisfy. Someone else, because it doesn't satisfy. There's only one thing that satisfies, that's Jesus. And I think that, that you know, it, I mean, I know it's fun to make fun of Hollywood because they do so much stuff worthy of being made fun of. But the reality is, once you become famous and wealthy, oftentimes you discover it's empty. It's empty. It doesn't satisfy. And so we want to, to plant that root that, that what really satisfies is that we walk with God. Now I've found something fascinating in all these years of studying the Bible. There are some passages that tell us we need to walk with Christ daily. Like I'm the vine, you're the branches, abide in me and I in you sort of thing. But most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time the Bible writes or is written or works from the assumption that we're walking with Christ. And this is what that looks like. This is how we live out of that. And this applies certainly right here. The Bible here talks about your know, root of all kind of evil and that we need to plant roots of respect and hard work and all that. And I just want to say, dads, don't tell your kids to work hard. Let them see it. A lazy dad is not a good role model. Hello? I was saying myself right there. That's right, preacher. Just keep working all morning. <laughs> so, so we want to show them that. We want to make sure to teach them the truth so that they will believe it and they'll live it. We want to teach them what's right and what's good and what's godly and what's holy. What it means to live a life that's set apart to God and from the world. We certainly want to teach them right principles about handling their finances. 
by finding contentment and perspective on possessions and, and all that kind of thing. But here's the reality. You can plant great roots, but if it's bad soil, there's no fruit. So the, the underlying assumption of this passage is that these roots are planted in good soil. And what is good soil? Good soil is when we belong to Jesus Christ. When we have put our faith in Him. When we belong to Him. You see, we don't want to just teach our children to respect people, to work hard. We don't want to just teach them, you know, good, sound, healthy teaching. We don't want to just teach them about right perspective on possessions. Most of all, we want to pray that God would make their heart good soil for these roots to take place. Each time we found out that we were going to have a child, we began to pray that someday God would convict them and call them to Himself. We began to pray not just for them, but for their future spouse that, of course, we did not even know. Because we could do all the teaching and root planting that we possibly could, but only God can make the soil good. Only God can make their heart receptive. So don't just teach these things to your children. Don't just plant these roots in their life, but pray for them that God would make them good soil, that these roots would take root and would produce much fruit for the kingdom of God. So it's not just about, hey, you know, we'll give you this stuff. We want them to receive it and for it to become their own. And for them, not just to be rooted, but to be fruited. <laughs> for them to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father, I know it always sounds so easy just to say we're set apart to you and set apart from the world. And it sounds so easy, just teach the truth. It sounds so easy to be content, regardless of whether we have much or little. But we realize that all of this is a challenge in life. And the only way that it's really going to work for us, and the only way it's really going to work for our children, the only way it's going to work for any generation, is if the soil is made right by you. And so God, I pray that you would help us as dads, to plant these roots in our children and plant them deeply. But God, we also pray that you would stir the soil, that you would water it, and that you would bring it into fruition in their lives. God, we realize that there are things you've called us to do, but the reality is ultimately you're the one who does it. And so we want to pray for our children. We pray for their future spouses. We pray for their lives and for their children and their grandchildren, that generation after generation, we might be deeply rooted in the good soil that you have made so that God's kingdom expands around the world. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.